Well, good evening. We're beginning our series on Wednesday evenings, going through the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So I'm going to read chapter one of the book of Acts before we then look at the questions that were on the study sheet. So this is Acts chapter one, beginning at verse one. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me, for John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. And all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language Akeldamar, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The book of the Acts of the Apostles is, in one sense, the sequel to all four of the Gospels, because it tells us what happens after the resurrection of Jesus and his return to heaven. But in another sense, the book of Acts is the sequel to Luke's Gospel in particular, because Luke wrote both of those books. Hence, both of them are addressed to someone Luke calls Theophilus. Both books present us with an account of what happened. 
Luke's Gospel covers the time from the birth of Jesus to his ascension to heaven, but focuses particularly on what Jesus began to do and teach. It focuses on those three years of public ministry. In the book of Acts, we discover how the Christian church started and then, in spite of heavy opposition, began to grow. It's interesting that Luke describes the ministry of Jesus as something that Jesus began. The implication is that there is still work to be done and Jesus is still going to be involved. Luke's attitude is unsurprising because, as we considered last Sunday, Jesus gave his followers instructions before he returned to heaven and he gave them a guarantee of his involvement. Matthew 28 verse 19 and 20, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. So the followers of Jesus will continue the ministry that Jesus began, in particular, in speaking about the kingdom of God and living as citizens of that kingdom. And through the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus will be involved in that kingdom building work. Before he returns to heaven, Jesus spends several weeks with the apostles, although it's worth remembering that many other people met the risen Jesus too. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And Luke tells us here that he provided many proofs of his resurrection. It's clear, not only from the writings in the New Testament, but also from the next generations of Christian writers, that those very first Christians were completely convinced about the resurrection of Jesus a conviction based on what they had personally witnessed. That's why they wouldn't deny it, even if it meant imprisonment or execution. Jesus also spends that time with his apostles, speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus had come as the promised eternal king, and through proclaiming the gospel, his followers would call people to become citizens of that kingdom and would then teach them how to live as citizens of the kingdom. So the book of Acts starts there, and it's still there at the end of the last chapter. We read about the Apostle Paul being in Rome, and the final verses of the final chapter of Acts tells us, He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, with all boldness and without hindrance. In other words, Paul's focus was to speak about the kingdom and its king, Jesus Christ. After Jesus has returned to heaven, the apostles find they're joined by two men in white robes. Clearly, these are angels through whom God gives an important prompt to the apostles. Verse 11, they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. One day, Jesus will return from heaven, and all of his people will rise and join him in the kingdom. But waiting for his return is not meant to be like waiting for a bus. So we're not to keep checking the timetable to try and work out when we should expect Jesus to appear. That's what Jesus warns about in verses 6 and 7. The apostles ask him if he was going to, at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel. In other words, was he going to be enthroned on earth now? But he tells them that the timetable is the responsibility of God the Father and is not for us to know. He says something very similar in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 36. 
But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus makes it very clear that his return will take everyone by surprise. And we're not to get caught up, therefore, in trying to predict when it will happen. Instead, we're to focus on simply being faithful to the Lord while we wait, because that is the best way to make sure we're ready for that final day. We recognised on Sunday that even though Jesus is now in heaven, he hasn't abandoned his people. He is with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We'll learn about the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost next time. But here, in verse 8, Jesus tells the apostles about one purpose of the Holy Spirit, to empower them to be witnesses for Jesus. They will share their testimony of knowing the Christ who died and rose again, and will teach the New Testament church what it means to have the gospel as its foundation. Thankfully, the testimony of the apostles will continue beyond their lifespans and beyond their journeying. We sometimes sing a children's song that asks the question, long ago they had no phones, no cameras or TV, so how did people share the news that now is history? And the answer, it was seen, then talked about, then written down for us. What the followers of Jesus witnessed would be talked about immediately, and then after a few years would be written down, so that, as Luke puts it at the start of his gospel, you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Jesus paints a picture of a global gospel rippling out from Jerusalem to all Judea and Samaria and then across the world. The good news of Jesus Christ and the testimony of the apostles continues to be proclaimed today when the Bible is faithfully shared and the gospel is preached. In that sense, the ministry of the apostles continues through the ministry of faithful Christian churches churches in which God dwells by his Holy Spirit, and that includes Welshpool Community Church. We're told in verse 12 that the group journeyed to Jerusalem and stayed in the upper room of a house. Here, there weren't just the apostles. We're told in verse 14 there were the women which is probably a reference to the group we read of in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means. It's clear from the Gospel accounts that there was a group of women present at the crucifixion and then at the tomb, and it's not surprising that they remained with the apostles after they had met the risen Jesus. This included Mary, the mother of Jesus. Plus, we're told that his brothers were in the group. When Jesus is dying on the cross, he instructs John to take care of Mary, and this implies that her husband, Joseph, had died, leaving Mary as a widow, and that would explain why we don't read about him being present in Acts chapter 1. Luke tells us that this group, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. They were patiently waiting for the promised Holy Spirit by joining together at God's throne in prayer. As we go further into this chapter, and then into chapter 2, we get a clearer picture of who else was there. In verse 15, we, we read that there were about 120 people gathered at one point, and clearly that's too many to fit in one room. But we read in chapter 2, verse 2, that there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, 
and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So while there was this group in the upper room, the entire house was being used, allowing a much larger group to gather together at times, whether just in the house or spilling out onto the street. And Peter refers to them as brothers, members of the family of God. So we have God's family gathering together. But in the upper room, we find Jesus's family, his mother and his brothers. This should encourage us in light of what we read in the Gospels. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we're told that when his family heard about what Jesus was doing, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Then in John chapter 7, verse 5, we're told that not even his brothers believed in him. But here we find the family of Jesus devoting themselves to prayer and trusting in his promises. This should be a great encouragement to those of us with unsaved family members. We may have witnessed to them many times and wonder how they can still remain in unbelief. We would have thought the same about the brothers of Jesus who remained cynical despite the incredible miracles he was carrying out. But God can sway the most stubborn of hearts, and he is able to save our family members. So let's try to be faithful and patient as we pray for them. Peter tells the group that has gathered together that they need to appoint a twelfth apostle, one to replace Judas, who had betrayed Jesus and then taken his own life. Peter quotes from the Old Testament to demonstrate this. He quotes from Psalm 69 and then Psalm 109. Psalm 69 is the cry of someone who is being pursued by enemies and feels completely abandoned. Verse 20, it says, I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Psalm 109 deals with a similar situation, and in verse 4 the psalmist says, In return for my love they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. And verse 25, I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. You can understand why Peter would apply these psalms prophetically to Jesus, and the words of judgment in the, those psalms to his betrayer, Judas. Peter also gives us a couple of very helpful principles for us to remember about the Old Testament. He says in verse 16, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Firstly, note that Peter describes the scripture, which literally means holy writings, as coming out of the mouth of David. Peter is sure that what David spoke or sang is the same as what was written down. We might sometimes wonder, how can we be confident that what people spoke in the Old Testament was quoted correctly when it was written down? <clears throat> we get that confidence from the teachings of Jesus and his apostles. For example, after the resurrection, Jesus reminded his followers in Luke 24 verse 44, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. But we find the Apostle Paul says the same thing, but slightly differently in Acts chapter 26, verse 22 to 23, where he claims to be saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. There is absolute confidence that what was said was then correctly written down. We can trust the Old Testament scriptures. How is that possible? How is that level of accuracy maintained? Well, Peter gives us a second principle that tells us how. In verse 16, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. We trust the accuracy of the Old Testament and also the New Testament because those who wrote down the scriptures 
were under the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. For example, before quoting from Psalm 110, Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, verse 36, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. So Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21, And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is why, when the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he describes the scripture as being God-breathed, almost as if those who were writing down the scriptures were having the words dictated to them by the Lord himself. Before choosing a twelfth apostle, Peter highlights an important qualification in verse 21. It must be one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, who could then be a witness to his resurrection. So the first leaders of the Christian church were men who had met the risen Jesus, who could say they were witnesses of his resurrection. This is incredibly significant for us today. In the writings of the New Testament, we have witness statements testifying to the resurrection. And it appears that most of the apostles would be executed because they refused to deny what they had witnessed. These were not powerful men coercing others to believe something and to suffer for it while they themselves lived in relative luxury and took few risks. These men would constantly put themselves at risk. They would suffer persecution and poverty. They would never be rich and they would never be popular. But they endured those things because in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they had seen firsthand undeniable evidence of eternal life and of the kingdom of heaven and therefore of everything else that Jesus had promised including a place in his father's house. They knew that Jesus would faithfully lead them to heaven if they faithfully followed him on earth. And their willingness to die rather than deny the gospel is evidence of their personal conviction. Their testimony is trustworthy. So in chapter one of Acts, we see the apostles told not to focus on the timetable for Jesus' return, but instead to prepare themselves to take the message of the kingdom, with the Holy Spirit's help, out into the world. 